All right. Um, can everyone hear me? Cool. Um, well, I'm going to start us off with a quick acknowledgement of country. Um, so I want to acknowledge that the land we're zooming in from today is stolen Indigenous land and that sovereignty was never ceded. Um, the colonial project that first took this land from its Indigenous custodians is ongoing. The violence against people, erasure of culture and disregard for country and environment that started with the arrival of settlers centuries ago has not stopped. Particularly important to recognize with regards to environmental activism is that the fact is the fact that First Nations people live sustainably and harmoniously with the country for many tens of thousands of years. Now, however, indigenous land management techniques are ignored and their voices silenced as the land is desecrated by fossil fuel machinery. There will be no environmental justice without First Nations justice. Um, back pre-COVID, we obviously primarily met organized and took part in Radhead Week events um, on UCID campus on Gadigal land. Of course, now though, meeting online, we're zooming in from all different lands. So to acknowledge this variety and network, please feel free to let us know which land you're currently on in the chat. Um, I'm going to hand over to Angus now, who's gonna give us, run us through a quick introduction. Uh, yeah, hey everyone. My name is Angus. I'm an environmental activist. Um, I'm quite involved with the UCID Enviro Collective. Um, and I'm glad that there are so many people at tonight's meeting. To kick us off, uh, we might get contributions from people that are here. Just like 30 seconds if you want to tell us, you know, what brings you to this meeting today and what you're kind of hoping to get out of it in terms of like, you know, what you want to know politically or what you want to know going forward. So yeah, if you want to just like raise your hand and then we can go to you. Maddie? Hey everyone, um, I'm Maddie. Um, I think with the theme of radical education, there's not a lot of spaces in education at the moment that talk about like the climate catastrophe and how to respond to it, you know, as activists. And I think that, um, yeah, with all the really great work that we did like last year and with all like the climate marches and stuff like that, I think there's a lot of potential for um, organizing, yeah. Yeah, thanks for that, Maddie. I think that's definitely true. Like I used to study wildlife conservation um, and they cut all the units about environmental politics. Uh, so I've actually learned more about the climate through activism than I have through my actual degree. Um, Zara? Yeah, pretty similar to Maddie. Um, I think our organizing last semester was really significant in the climate movement in Sydney. Um, it's a real shame about lockdown, but a lot of my learning as well has come out of spaces, activist spaces like this. And I really want to learn more about the IPCC report because I think there's just like a lot of news around it, but not a lot of clarity um, and a lot of like sensationalizing of it. So, yeah. Isabella. Yeah. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I'm really excited today to, um, as Zara said, um, learn about more of the content of what's in the IPCC report um, and also just nail down um, some concrete sort of actions that we can take. I feel like after a report like this comes out, um, it's very natural to feel very sort of upset and downheartened. Um, and so I've come here looking for some, some hope and some direction today. Cooper. Oh yeah, I was yeah, agree, agree with what people said. Like I when seeing the reports on the IPCC report is horrific and just completely filled me with despair. I don't know about other people, but being involved in climate activism and actually, you know, what what can we actually do about this horrible sort of catastrophe um, in terms of the scale and urgency we need? That's really key things I think um, that I hope people can take out of it and that I'm looking yeah, look forward to as well. Yeah, thanks, Cooper. Um, that might do us for intros. I'll hand over to Tiger now for a Kahoot. All right, cool. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to escape my screen. 
I'm still figuring my way around hosting Zooms, to be honest. Oh, not that one. There we go. Oh, wait, you're all on pause screen anyway. Okay. Um, Kahoot. So probably the best way to do this is pull up Kahoot on your phone. Uh, the questions and answers aren't going to be on the, the actual Kahoot window. Um, so unless you want to split screen or something or just flick between the Zoom and the Kahoot screen, um, yeah, pull it up on your phone. I know my grandma is in the audience. So um, Ray, a Kahoot is just like an online kind of game thing that um, if you want to just look up Kahoot.com, you'll be able to play along uh, while we do it. All right. Um, Sorry, I'm just setting it up still. All right, cool. Can you all see that? Sweet. All right. There is your game pin. Whoever's playing as Tiger Perkins, I hope you do the name proud. All right, I'm going to assume most people are in by now. Actually, we've still got a few people coming in. One second. Yeah. All right, is everyone ready? Feel free to shout out if you're still logging in. Um, all right, I might kick off then. So the, the first one's no question, don't worry, it's just a quick slide. Um, just a, a cartoon my dad found reading the paper online yesterday that I quite liked. Um, anyway, we're going to skip that one. I don't know really why I put that on, but let's go. All right, so question one, what does the IPCC stand for? Yes, so Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, obviously. That was just a quick one to warm up, hopefully. Um, if you didn't get that right, well, that's why we're here to learn. Wait, did I skip the question? No, it's who is the federal, the federal Environment Minister, if you didn't see the question. Yeah, cool, Susan Lake. So Matt Keane's the, the New South Wales Environment Minister. Um, Belinda Hutchinson's the Chancellor of the Uni, and Alan Tudge is the Federal Ed Minister. Uh, we like to see it, Aurora. You're doing <laughs> me well done. Um, all right. Question three What year was it first discovered that the presence of carbon in the atmosphere would lead to global warming?
1856, um, Eunice Foote, an American scientist, discovered this when she used an air pump and two cylindrical receivers to test the effect of air density, air moisture, and carbonic acid on the temperature of the air. Question four. So multi-select, so there might be multiple correct answers. Which companies do you should currently have investments in? Nice. Um, yeah, so you should don't have any direct investments in fossil fuels anymore, I don't believe, but they have um, hundreds of millions in indirect investments in all of the companies that you see on the screen and many, many more through like investment portfolios. Question five, who coins the term greenhouse effect? So yeah, there were two correct ones here. Um, in 1896, Svante Henjus in a paper used the term Drivbank, which is Swedish, which translates to greenhouse or hothouse, but Pointing was the first person to actually use the term greenhouse effect around 1900-ish as well. All right, question six. How do you spell school strike for climate in Swedish as seen on Greta's science? <laughs> Dad, you're not on mute. <laughs> Leo, can you mute him, please? Uh, yes. <laughs> Um, I'm not going to try and say it, but if we've got any Swedish speakers, feel free to jump in. Tony Cliff is winning. <laughs> All right, next up we've got, which country has the highest total carbon emissions? Yeah, China accounts for roughly 30% of um, the world's annual carbon emissions with over 10 billion metric tons a year, double that of the second place United States. True or false, Australia has higher per capita emissions than the US. Yeah, so it's true. Um, Australia has 15 and a half in the US, just over 15 metric tons per capita per year, uh, which puts Australia at sixth highest in emissions in the world. Um, the top three kind of being dominated by like um, fossil fuel exporters, um, Qatar, Kuwait, the UAE. All right, and final question, what were the green bands of the 1970s? <laughs> All right, let's see who did well. Elise, congratulations. Tony Cliff, congrats. And the winner is climate time. All right. So I'm going to pause my share and go back to... Uh, 
the slideshow and I'll hand over to Angus, who's going to give us a bit of a um, an intro to the IPCC report and tell us about what it said. Um, so yeah, I guess the main reason uh, that we're having this meeting right now is because of that recent IPCC report, uh, which I'm sure many of you would have seen. Uh, so just for some context, the IPCC, uh, which stands for Intergovernmental, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, is the world's most authoritative body on climate change. Uh, and it was formed in 1988. Um, and according to their website, it was created to provide policymakers with regular scientific assessments on climate change, its implications and potential future risks as well as to put forward adaptation and mitigation options. Um, so since that first report in 1990, there have been reports roughly every seven years. Uh, and what we saw recently was the first of three parts of the latest one. The other two parts we won't see until next year. Uh, that report had hundreds of experts from all around the world contributing to it. Um, and it came out early this month. It's a very comprehensive analysis of the climate crisis. Uh, and it's a very long document, but if you've been paying attention, uh, then you could probably guess you know, what it said. Uh, the Secretary General of the UN described the report as a code red for humanity, uh, which is something that I think has been felt by many since the release of that report. So the key takeaway from it is that climate change is an immediate threat to humans, um, and that we must take significant action on it to avoid the full extent of its damage. Um, so based on our current trajectory, we will reach 1.5 degrees Celsius of warming by 2030. But even in the most ambitious scenario in the report, which humans clearly aren't sticking to, uh, we're going to hit 1.5 degrees Celsius by 2035. So that doesn't mean, uh, you know, the death of all of us in the environment. Uh, but beyond that point, things do start to look a lot worse. We're already seeing ecological disaster play out at our current level um, with unprecedented fires and heat waves around the world. So I'm sure we'd all remember the fires in Australia in 2019 and 2020. Um, and it was so disappointing to see such familiar scenes in Greece recently. You know, an important takeaway from this report, I think, is that scientists have been warning about us about this for so long. Um, and we knew this would happen, uh, but the with the report in the public eye in such a significant way, we can hold the government to account like never before. Um, so on the relevance to the, of the report to us here in Australia, outside of the obvious global impacts outline, um, there was a lot to be said for us specifically. So sea levels around Australia and New Zealand are set to continue rising. Fires are projected to get worse and more frequent. Um, and we're gonna see fewer days of rain, but when it comes, it will be more intense and lead to flooding. Uh, if we hit two degrees Celsius of warming, then droughts are going to increase uh, in Eastern Australia, having already increased in Southern Australia. So I know that sounds like a lot of climate doom and gloom, uh, and it's hard not to feel disheartened, but I, I think we should make it clear that this report is not the end of the world and that we can change the course of the climate crisis, you know, as we're going to talk about tonight. I guess the main thing for us now is uh, what we do with this report. You know, there have been reports every seven years, like I said, but none have been this high profile or had such immediate implications. And that report makes it abundantly clear, if it wasn't already, that climate action is necessary. Um, but that action is going to have to come from us. The general public and world leaders have responded to the report, as we're going to talk about. Uh, but we're going to have to force them to take action on it. But yeah, I think we have uh, some time for discussion now about the IPCC report. Uh, if people have any contributions they would like to make about it. Yeah, what are people's thoughts on the report? Um... Where do we go from here? Any, yeah, any comments? Um, personally, for me, I'm studying environmental studies. So it wasn't anything that I didn't already know. Um, you know, it just cemented the fact what, what we already knew and it kind of brought light um, to issues that other people probably didn't, um, weren't aware of it. And the only diff, like in what I'm learning, um, I'm using GIS, which is a programming service where we see um, the future impacts of like 1.5 degrees warming in um, agriculture in Australia for one of my subjects. And now that's basically gonna happen anyway. So we shouldn't like, in my opinion, we should be looking at 2% instead of 1.5. Um, so I think it's definitely shows that um, it's a lot worse than people thought. Leah? Um, yeah, oh no, my mom's talking. Just do someone else. 
the speaking list is open. Sorry, I will actually go. Um, and that's just one oh. thing. Um, in the political economy of the environment course I'm doing, the lecturer said how like looking across all of the um like reports that have happened since the IPC started, this is like the one that is the most like definitive language. Like instead of being like this could happen or this might happen, it's like all like science on this shows that this is the case um but also the point Viv said in the chat is really really important I think when we're thinking about like how this report's produced and like the the authorities that that made it Maddie yeah and that that's really interesting because I've also heard that the IPCC report is well has been I guess like more conservative compared to like Extinction Rebellion and like other scientists reports too so the fact that it's so definitive is quite like alarming that even you know more this like moderate body can give such like yeah definition about what's going to happen. Lauren? Yeah I would echo what everyone else has said and also note that um I think one of the things which Scott Morrison kind of pushed when it first came out was this idea that it's like the responsibility or fault of like developing nations or like the global South. Um, whereas, you know, you can like comprehensively lay the blame and fault for um, climate change at the feet of like the global North um, doing a lot of like extractive kind of exploitation of developing countries so I think that um it's really important to consider like the relationships between states as well in terms of like who is benefiting from like the violent extraction of fossil fuels and things like that. Cooper? Yeah one thing about the report um that I found yeah like in terms of it was talking about how in the last 50 years warming has been faster of the planet than any time the last 2000 years um, that same 50 year period has actually also seen the biggest increase in emissions ever. Um, it's actually a very brief period and it has only escalated. And this is also the same period, by the way, which we became aware of climate change and in which we saw, you know, international conference after international conference, you know, punctuating almost like every, every decade since, since we've um, found out about this and since it's become ever more clear the connection between um, you know, uh, what our economy is doing it to the and the effect that it's having on the climate. Um, it's also the same period that we've seen a switch um, in restructuring of the global economy um, that has unleashed kind of this competitive accumulation um, of businesses worldwide. And I don't think that's a coincidence at all, um, which has led to, you know, some of these massive corporations which dominate the amount of emissions that get released, like the, you know, it's a classic statistic of 100 um companies responsible for 70 percent of emissions like it's this tiny number of giant corporations who whose wars are fought over in their interests who are directly destroying our ability to sustain life on this planet at all to have oxygen to have a, a, a temperatures that we can live in to have water we can drink and food we can eat uh, not to mention the insane uh, natural disasters that are only going to escalate and be complete catastrophe um which i think really you know on one level it shows the scale of the problem these the governments have shown utterly incapable of being able to deal with this despite all their high sounding words their international conferences it's actually gotten worse since they've started having these conferences and, and discussing how to deal with climate change why because they can't unhook themselves from an economic system in which um fossil fuels are embedded into its very heart you know, it, it, it's actually fundamental to the basic functioning um, of, of the most profitable industries in the world. That's the reason. So I think the conclusion we have to draw is we need to force them. We've had massive uh, um, climate strikes, you know, you know, big demonstrations or whatever, but we they, they, can, they can kind of sniff at that. What we need is a sort of situation where we get mass strikes that can actually Put a challenge to the to the profits at the heart of the system which is why and the, the role we can play in the in the enviro collective as, as students is very important in terms of giving a political lead um in and trying to show that yeah we can inspire kind of workers to take to take action and just very very quickly i just wanted to also say that i think the 
flip side of the doom and gloom. We need to understand the doom and gloom because we need to understand there's this massive task ahead of us. But the other side of that is actually the majority of people think the government is doing nowhere near enough on climate change and more needs to be done. They just don't see that something can be done about it. Maybe they'll sign a petition at most. Maybe they'll vote that way in the election if there's not some other issue that's more important to them. But otherwise, they just don't see its thing. So what we do as a- activists is to, tr- to show in practice that we can do something about it. And if we do, we can provide a challenge. It's not that people are apathetic or passive. So yeah, that's what I want to say. Thanks for letting me go on. Yeah, thanks everyone for those contributions. You know, I think it is really important to note just how definitive that report is. Like the answers are all there and the politicians won't uh, listen to them, you know, unless we force them, which I think Tiger is going to talk about now. Yeah, um, thanks everyone. Thanks, Cooper. I've, I've learned better than to try and wrap you up, um, but you speak very well. So glad to have your input. Um, so yeah, we're going to move on now to the gas-led recovery um, and what it means and how the, the government's forced kind of this wedge between um, these two ideas, climate action and jobs, which really are very interrelated, but that the government has kind of um, placed in, in kind of like, people will have an understanding now that they're kind of antithetical and can opposed uh, when really we need climate jobs. Um, but yeah, just in terms of the gas slide recovery, um, I'm, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna read you some quotes from Scott Morrison, which I think are quite funny. Um, so uh, while the bushfires were raging in the summer of 2019, 2020, uh, ScoMo defended the use of coal because of its economic value and the, and the people it employed. Quote, what we, what we won't do is engage in reckless and job destroying and economy crunching targets, which are being sought, he said, when speaking to alternative renewable energy plans. In a visit to regional Queensland at the start of the year, um, he was asked about coal mines that might have a life of 30 years or longer left to live. And he said, what's important is that we continue to extract and get the value from the opportunity and wealth that's there. That's really what benefits the rest of this country. Um, And then on the topic of coal mines, he continued, so long as they comply with all the environmental standards and all the environmental requirements, well, they should get on with their business. Um, what exactly these environmental standards are remains kind of unclear. Um, but what is clear is that he's not worried about fossil fuels and he's not worried about climate targets, noting that it would be preferable if we reach, if we reach net zero emissions by 2050, uh, when the experts say we need to do so much closer to 2030. Um, he's also, there's this crazy idea um, which we really need to fight back against that we can place the, our, our climate hopes in future as yet non-existent technologies rather than um, really tangible renewable energies that we've, we've got available to us now. Um, he said when the government, um, he said in regards to the government that they intend to proceed with the transition to zero emissions by investing and partnering in the technology breakthroughs needed to reduce and offset emissions in a way that enables our heavy industry in particular to continue and to keep energy costs down. Um, so it makes sense then for someone obviously who's, who's prone to ignoring climate science to believe in a gas led recovery, uh, a scheme based on an idea that Morrison has used repeatedly in speeches over the last few years, uh, noting that there is no credible energy transition plan for an economy like Australia that does not involve the greater use of gas. Um, he's also proposed that gas is a safer fossil fuel, whatever that means, um, claiming that it produces only 50% of the carbon emissions of coal. Uh, Recent studies have suggested, however, that um, due to methane leakage, which had previously remained uncalculated, gas may be even worse for the environment than coal. Rather than dabble in semantics, though, the simple fact is that gas is a fossil fuel and subsidizing fossil fuel projects these days with the state of our climate is just absolutely ridiculous. I want to take us back to the, the national energy address that Morrison gave in, um, at the start of the year um, in the Hunter. Uh, speaking for almost 45 minutes, he gave a 5,000 word speech about this gas led recovery. Um, and so I'm just going to take some of the salient points from it. Um, he, announced, he announced measures to expand the gas industry, but barely mentioned renewables beyond passing reference. I thought it'd be kind of funny to 
see how many times he spoke about the climate in the speech. So I, I keyword searched the, the 5,000 word document. He didn't say the, the word climate once, um, let alone address climate change. Um, so I thought, you know, he might be using a different word like environment or something, skirting around the word climate. Um, but he only used the word environment three times in the 5,000 words. Um, and I've got a list here of the way that he uses them. So we've got one, um, he's talking about there being certainty with regards to the investment environment. Um, and then we've got the second one in where he said, all levels of government have a role to play in creating a supportive environment for investment and competition. And then the, the third and final time that he used the word environment was when he said, um, this is a reality. Australia needs to be prepared for a more unpredictable, less favorable global environment. I thought that was pretty good until he of course finished it off with both strategically and economically. Um, so I'm gonna open it up to discussion now and I want to hear people's thoughts on kind of like what tactics do management and politicians engage in to distract us uh, from the real issues, from the, the real alternatives? What, how do, it, can, it doesn't have to be necessarily related to climate change, although that'll, that'll probably be the focus. But yeah, what, what kind of tactics, scare tactics or kind of ignoring tactics do management and politicians use? Um, yeah, Gemma. Big one is pointing to other things that are happening. So like COVID is obviously such a good opportunity for them to say that we have to focus on one thing or that's that's called the big enough economic issue that we can't try and fix this other problem. Um, a kind of shifting blame away, but also kind of assuming the idea that you have to do certain steps that you can't skip, like with the whole gas thing that's going, well, you have to move from coal to gas before you can move to anything else when you could feasibly just move straight to working on renewables when Australia is actually such a good environment for that. I think those are some of them. Yeah, definitely. I'm just going to give people a chance who haven't spoken yet to speak. So we're going to go to Fabian. Hey, yeah. Um, I just wanted to comment on the job argument that they have that we're going to generate, you know, thousands of jobs for, you know, everyday Australians and it's going to be good for the economy and blah, blah, blah. Um, this whole argument is completely false anyway because they're pushing for automation. Like I did a documentary in my undergrad um, on the new Adani Carmichael mine um, and the whole argument was we're going to create thousands of jobs for everyday Aussies but on their website they were bragging about how the mine is going to be 100% automated. So there's this contradiction of these lies they're telling people that you know you're going to get a job but at the same time we're going to be completely automated. So is anyone actually going to get a job out of it? Like, it's just like they're perpetuating these complete lies. Um, yeah, and that's just a separate issue, like of the actual impact of <laughs> mines itself on the environment. But like, this whole job argument is just completely false. Yeah, definitely. And, and if those jobs do eventuate, what kind of jobs are they? Are they unionized? Are they even well paid? Are they high quality? Are they um, yeah, but we'll get to that a bit later when we look at some specific kind of manifestations of this gas slide recovery. Um, but yeah, Sam, and then we'll take Lauren and then I might close the speaking list. Uh, cool. Um, one of the ones that I find most infuriating is um, this constant return to the concept of the, the base load power, um, which is a concept that was incredibly relevant for 20th century industry, um, but is losing its relevance with smart systems that can manage um, the changing, you know, um, the fluctuations in power delivery from the system. Uh, the important thing to remember with base load is it's not, it's not a base generation, it's the base load on the system. And that came about through large manufacturing um, and industry which doesn't really exist in Australia to the same extent. Um, so when we insist that base load is important, we're no longer, we're, we're not really looking at what the modern Australian economy looks like. Um, and it's an, so it's just an outdated concept um, that I think we should dismiss and stop listening to. Yeah, cool. Thank you. Um, Lauren, if you don't mind keeping it a bit quick. 
sure, a couple of things. The first one would be um, like identity politics, I think, are kind of used to um, distract, particularly when like female politicians um, do anything related to the environment. Like Julia Gillard was like subject to, I mean, you know, lots of problems there, but like subject to a massively misogynistic campaign related to like the carbon tax, which the coalition and their like media people like Peter Credlin acknowledged wasn't even a carbon tax. Um, and, you know, I think that like just inane kind of reporting on things that people wear and things that people say in like the course of the political day um, are used a lot to distract from like the substantive points that they might be making. Um, and there was another thing, but I cannot remember. <laughs> That's all good. Um, I've got, if you remember it, this is a little pick of ScoMo after he got stuck in the mine shaft coming out of a mine in regional Queensland. Um, so a bit of karma, perhaps, if you believe in that. Um, but yeah, we're going to go back to Angus now to look at Curry Curry and some contemporary manif manifestations of what this gas led recovery looks like. Yeah, thanks, Tiger. Um, you know, obviously the gas led recovery is uh, one, of, one of the main concerns that we have to go up against as climate activists. And at the center of that uh, is the Curry Curry gas plant, um, which is a $600 million gas plant that's going to be built in New South Wales. Um, this is using public money uh, because no private companies wanted to invest in uh, Kari Kari, believe it or not. ScoMo had to force it through himself using our money. Um, but $600 million, no matter who's investing, is the same amount of public money uh, going into fossil fuels. You know, this comes right after that IPCC that we talked about has called for all coal and gas plants to close in 10 years. Um, but ScoMo has justified that by claiming that uh, this gas plant will create jobs for the people there. Uh, this is, again, not true. Um, after construction, Kari Kari will only create 10 full-time jobs. Uh, what it will create is 14.8 million tonnes of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so this is something that, you know, we need to be uh, responding to quite strongly as activists. Uh, it really is the centre of his plans. Um, so right now, coincidentally, quite a good coincidence. Um, we are in the middle of the Workers for Climate Action Week of Action uh, about Kari Kari. Um, so that's been going on from Monday uh, to Friday. Uh, there's a whole bunch of stuff that people can do to get involved in that. If someone could post a Facebook event in the chat, that would be great. Or I can do it after I finish speaking. Uh, but there's an online rally tomorrow night at 6 p.m. Uh, it would be great if everyone here could attend that uh, and get as many people as possible along to that. There's going to be unionists, First Nation activists, students all there. Um, and hopefully, you know, we can pass a, a motion in this meeting a little bit later. Uh, but yeah, I think Kari Kari is something that we do need to be you know, resisting quite strongly. The people in Kari Kari do deserve good jobs, uh, but a gas-fired power plant like this won't uh, provide those jobs. It'll just create more emissions. Um, so I think the just transition really plays out quite strongly uh, in the case for Kari Kari. Cool. Thanks, Angus. Um, I'm going to talk about a bit about now as a bit now about the, um, the Narrabai gas project as well. Um, and I want to thank Viv for your Oni article from which I've stolen most of this information because um, it was very well, very well articulated. Um, so the, the Narrabri gas project is another project as part of this gas led recovery um, up in the Piliga in northern rural New South Wales. Um, and it's about six hours north. It's in 2018, the site was approved by the New South Wales Independent Planning Committee for a $3.6 billion coal seam gas project um, to be carried out by Australia's second largest oil and gas producer, Santos. Uh, as part of Morrison's gas led recovery and supposedly a less dangerous alternative to fossil fuels, the Narrabri gas project proposed the creation of 850 coal seam gas wells over a period of 20 years, obviously with um, viabilities and lives extending a lot longer than that. Uh, coal seam gas wells bring untreated production water up to the surface in order to release the natural gas from the seam, which is often contaminated with salt, heavy metals, and other toxic contaminants. Hydraulic fracturing, known as fracking, is also often used to stimulate gas flow in wells, allowing companies to drain the land. Um, fracking, infamous for the devastation it wreaks on the natural environment, increases the likelihood of contaminating groundwater sources. Coal seams are often connected to underground 
water aquifers, such as the Great Artesian Basin, um, and extraction, so at risk the poisoning of entire water sources as well as the ecosystems that rely on them. So obviously incredibly dangerous. Um, fracking has is infamous and has total disapproval from kind of any environmental group. Um, and Viv spoke to Mr. Brady, um, a, a Camilleray man from um, on country. And he said, there's been a total lack of engagement and respect for First Nations people of these communities. The conversation needs to be had and led by First Nations people. So on top of this, Santos uh, doing very little work on the ground to engage First Nations people and the local communities um, in decision-making processes. But there has been positively some really strong resistance in Narrabri. Um, there was overwhelming public condemnation of the project. Over 23,000 submissions were made during the 90-day exhibition period of Santos's environmental impact statement, um, with almost 99% of them condemning the project. Only 300 of the 23,000 submissions actually supported it. Um, so yeah, overwhelming both local and national and as well as some international submissions um, against the project. Uh, First Nations activists from organizations like Camilleray Next Generation, uh, who are a network of Gomorrah activists um, from up that way, have banded together with the passionate locals and the community at large um, to create a sustained and impressive resistance to Santos and the Narrabri Gas Project. On the ground, lock-ons and protest camps have held the line against Santos uh, and the encroachment of gas, restriction, gas extractions. And in the past, the local roads and traffic authority have looked the other way when asked to remove protesters. Truckers driving down from Northern Queensland have dropped off food for people on picket lines, um, things like that. The local community, however, is according to Santos divided um, in part due to uh, just such corporate bullshit. Like they, they, they sponsor the Santos rugby festival in the Narrabri uh, in an attempt to get locals on side um things like that corporate tactics um and most of the work that has actually materialized because the project started um a long time ago um in other areas and it's slowly slowly working its way up here most of the, the jobs have become automated as um, i think it was fabian was saying before uh, so there's not even jobs there's not even local jobs for uh for the community um, so we're going to open it up again for a bit more discussion about the current project. So, yeah, just if you haven't spoken yet, um, put up your hand or pop a star in the chat. What surprised you about these projects? What lessons are there to learn from the struggles? Uh, what alternatives are there to a gas-led recovery? And what can we do? Where can we go from here? Does anyone want to speak to any of these questions? Yeah, Sam. Um, I can speak to the alternatives to a gas led recovery. Sure. Um, there are there are so many so many alternatives to a gas led recovery, and there are countless documents um, reports on how we could approach a green new deal. Um, and specifically in the Australian context, um, a lot of which already builds on work that community groups are doing. Um, one of the important things for um, a changing our lifestyles and economy towards um, lower emissions is not just changing the way we produce our energy, but changing the kinds of uh, productive activity we do. Um, and a lot of that can be care work. So aged care, uh, you know, rehabilitating, or not rehabilitating, addressing um, land destruction. Um, obviously, there are plenty of groups already working on this, but making that paid work, um, you know, increased health care, uh, preventative health care, rather than just, um, you know, retroactively fixing things. All these can contribute to um, decarbonizing our economy. And, 
you know, increasing the well-being of uh, Australians and the rest of the world as well. Yeah, cool. Um, James, did you lower your hand or did it time out? Do you want to speak? Oh, yeah, I'll jump in. Maybe I'll mix it again. Um, uh, yeah, no, I just want to say great um, presentation. I think it really summed up and tied together all the, all the different threads of this. Um, I think one of the things that I've been thinking about is like, well, how do we, like, what do we do with all this, like, bad news, essentially? Because it, like, it does seem really dire. And I think a lot of the code red stuff can be really quite frightening and like anxiety inducing. Um, but yeah, I guess I just come back to this, to the idea that like, you know, action is the best medicine. Like you sort of take whatever action you can do at whatever level you can, like with whoever you can. Um, and, and, you know, really that's how we're going to sort of get through this. And, and there is really a lot that we can do um, from a grassroots level. I think as, as students, it's important that we like, you know, take this opportunity to like really learn about what's what's happening. And so I think we're doing that now. Um, and then, you know, thinking about what, what, what can we propose and how can we tie into other movements like the workers, um, like broader workers struggle um, and really try and strengthen like the union movement, for example, because, you know, if we're going to get to a situation where, you know, there was in the Kahoot, like the, the example of the green bands, which I think is like one of the best examples of climate action and like environmental action um, in Australian um, recent colonial history, um, then I think we really need to strengthen the union movement. So like that, that just means organizing in our workplaces. It means like organizing as workers and trying to really um, see these struggles as interconnected. Because I think if, you know, it, it's tricky when all of this, crazy stuff is happening and then like it seems like there's way too many issues but when you kind of tie them all together and we, we start working on them as one big issue um i think that that really makes things a lot more real um and a lot more achievable so i think there's a lot we can do so um yeah i think i think trying to trying to trying to you know merge different struggles together like you know and and really just sort of assert that we shouldn't have to pay for all this stuff that you know other people are doing just for profit um, and that extends from COVID to the climate crisis as well so yeah yeah definitely um Viv hi yes um just kind of something about um the Narrabri gas project that I think shocked me but I wasn't actually really that surprised was the effect that it had on on local communities and how that um that kind of fragments the communities because uh, I mean you mentioned that Santos um, sponsored that festival of rugby. And I remember being on one side of the fence outside of the, the stadium, kind of, you know, with, with, with the people who were like yelling and screaming and, and, you know, protesting. And one of the indigenous activists I talked to later said, um, oh, like my, my nephew or my niece was actually um, on stage performing um, at the festival. And that was really heartbreaking to hear, I think. Um, and the treatment, um, the way that Santos, I think, treats those communities I remember so uh obviously there's been kind of a lot of community surveys done in that area but I remember that in actually Alana might might remember this a little bit better than me Alana was on the same trip <laughs> that I was on um but for one of the surveys they didn't actually give people the option to completely reject the project they asked for their general opinions but didn't give them the option to say no we don't actually want this Alana might have a bit more of a memory on this. Um, it's been a while, but yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, okay, um, Alev, and then we might move on. Yeah, um, similarly, when I went on like a older road trip, um, there was a thing about like how Santos had actually like called up this family late at night. They'd called the sons and told and like lied to them about how their mum was planning to like sell off the house or whatever. So they were literally like, planning to cause rifts between this family to like you know cause like problems in the community and make sure that people just fuck off and it was just like I was like how low can you really get but yeah it happens like it's really cooked yeah um and in just in terms of positive stuff that we can look to and and solutions and things because um, I know solutions-based approaches are quite important. We're just going to quickly have a look at a just transition, what that means uh, before we wrap up. Um, so 
a, a just transition is essentially the idea that those impacted by a transition away from the fossil fuel industry and towards renewable energies should have their voices heard in, in, the, in the new system. Um, so when we dismantle the fossil fuel industry, we don't want to leave behind fossil fuel workers. We don't want to leave behind First Nations people um, from local communities. We don't want to leave behind people on the ground. Um, so we need to prioritize, prioritize those groups when we look at transitioning. We don't we need to reject the capitalist logic that says uh, the cheapest workers get jobs with sh with shitty standards and shitty pay, um, and whoever whoever comes can get them. It's we need to prioritize really clearly some groups on the ground. Um, so a a just transition means guaranteed jobs for impacted fossil fuel workers in the new renewable energy industry. It means big redundancy packages or retraining for those who want it. Uh, it means prioritizing local communities and First Nations people when the new jobs are divvied up. Uh, it means high quality, well-paid, safe, unionized jobs. Um, it means, uh, yeah, that we reject the kind of exploitative logic of capitalism um, and move towards kind of this working for the community um, publicly owned renewables, not-for-profit, um, no privatization, things like that. Um, so yeah, um, we've, got, we've got some final questions here. How do we remove the, the wedge between climate action and jobs and what role do the unions have to play? Um, and then I'm just gonna go quickly to the next slide as well, which is what we were gonna finish up on. So we might end up going like five minutes or so over. Uh, but if anyone wants to talk to the previous questions or these ones as well, um, feel free to raise your hand or drop an asterisk in the chat. Yeah, Cooper. Um, sorry, I'm just doing peanuts. Um, yeah, on the thing of like the, I think that's a really great question of like how we overcome this the antagonism between jobs and action on climate change because that's exactly how the right has been able to, um, you know, really kind of prevent the climate movement overcoming people's real felt fears over you know loss of jobs and you know the the you know whatever what a transition away would look like even in curry curry it's very clear well it's so cynical like the thing's going to create 10 jobs it's like well they desperately need jobs you know the hunter desperately need jobs they've had actually the fossil fuel industries are being completely gutted out these are industries people rely on they don't want to hear about we need to close more coal mines they want to hear about what what are the jobs of the future what are the jobs my kids are going to do what the jobs that are going to get the um get the community going but I think concretely, so obviously we can raise that there's kind of industries that could be created, you know, on an ideological level of like through climate action and the, in the care sector and all the kind of uh, flow on effects that would provide meaningful work for people um, in a decarbonized economy. But I think the other thing is the, the climate movement has to look, look serious behind that has to be front and center of the whole climate movement, just transitions, you know, um, for workers has to be a central demand. But I think the, the sense in which people have, well, can we actually deliver on that is how strong the climate movement is. So even I think people are right to talk about, you know, the actions of workers being the most central thing that's gonna that, to actually um, tip the scale in winning climate action. Um, but I think, you know, even in terms of the experience I've had um, in climate activism at uni, raising those demands, I remember at the beginning of 2019, raising demands of just transition and green jobs, sort of derided by, um, the school strikers, you know, that we shouldn't have these demands and rah, rah, rah. By the end of the year, they're, they're going, having unionists speaking on their platform about climate jobs, having, you know, working with, actively seeking alliances with the unions um, and, and talking about just transitions and having it be a central demand. Um, so, you know, I think the, the sense in which we can intervene over this politically makes a very big difference. But, the, but if we have an explosive movement on the campuses, an explosive movement on the streets, which has just transitions at its centre, public renewables at its centre, which doesn't, you know, get confused about, well, oh, maybe this renewable energy zones are right, maybe this carbon taxes are right, maybe we market mechanism here, but it's very firm on the question of 
what the transition is actually going to look like and what it's going to look like for ordinary people in particular, that will be the key thing, I think, to showing a credible alternative to what is obviously just lies and dishonesty about the prospects of jobs in fossil fuels that's put forward by the government and the right. Cool, thanks. Um, all right, we're going to go with Fabian, maybe try and keep it to like 30 seconds if you can. Yeah, I just basically wanted to say the same thing. I totally agree. Like, um, yeah, talking about a just transition, I've never heard that term before. Um, I think that's, yeah, I think that's really great and really um, good opposition to the whole jobs argument. And um, just show like solidarity to, you know, all Australians who do feel like, you know, they feel like they need to have a mind job to put food on the table for their kids, you know, and they don't see these alternatives. So. I think that's yeah I think that's a really awesome project um to um to work towards yeah so that's really awesome yeah cool thanks um yeah enviro activists have been down to these communities and and spoken to these people and they're like well yeah we don't want to be fossil fuel workers we we hate this industry we hate what it's doing to the planet and the climate um but you know we've got to put food on the table at the end of the day and give us an alternative and we'll take it um yeah Lauren um, yeah, I would agree with most of the things that have been said as well. I think that um, looking at like individual actions, like we have like historically low union density at the moment across basically all industries in Australia. So like that's a really good place to start. And I think that um, when you have like particularly like skilled and also young workers kind of coming into the unions, you can assuage a lot of the like historical risks that have been associated with them. Um, but like the fact of the matter is you don't get wins for workers unless like you unionize workplaces super heavily. Um, and I also think that allowing for like making sure that like political rhetoric across climate groups is really like strong and cohesive is also super important um, because that's kind of where one of I think the main downfalls of um, climate groups can kind of occur uh, when there are like massive ideological differences. So it's good to, you know, for us all to work, like work together to realize that like just transition. Yeah, cool, thanks. Um, we've, I've just got like a little picture collage here and in the middle, the, the QR code in the middle is for tomorrow's UC Enviro Collective meeting. If you've been inspired and want to come along and on the bottom left to the the enviro collective page for the 21 2021 team um we're just before we go we're we're gonna pass um a motion hope, well hopefully we're gonna propose a motion um but yeah i'm gonna hand over to angus to explain that um yeah i, I don't think there's gonna be you know any dissent to the motion uh given the contents of this meeting uh, but the motion just reads that uh, we support the week of action to stop the Kari Kari gas plant and the online rally on Wednesday, August 25th, uh, and that we oppose Scott Morrison's gas fight recovery, the proposed gas plant in Kari Kari and all new coal and gas developments. Um, and that instead, we demand a just transition to 100% publicly owned renewable energy with secure jobs for vulnerable energy workers. Um, I don't think there's going to be any dissent to that. Uh, I believe there's also a uh, motion uh, from the Refugee Action Coalition, uh, if India can speak to that quickly. Um, yeah, so basically um, in light of the crisis of in Afghanistan that I'm sure a lot of you are aware of um, with the Taliban coming to power, um, Australia has, well, ScoMo has come out and said that it's not going to let any Afghan refugees into the country, despite, you know, other countries like Canada and the UK accepting in up to like 20,000 refugees. Um, lots of other countries as well, but um, I can just post the motion from the Refugee Action Coalition in the chat as well. I just did basically immediately grant visas to all Afghan refugees and asylum seekers on temporary protection and bridging visas. Actually, maybe I won't read through it all, but you guys can read through it in the chat. Um, so yeah, maybe we'll do in conjunction with the Curry Curry one so everyone can raise hands for both, I guess. So yeah, if you if you agree with the proposals and the motions, um, feel free to turn your camera on and raise a fist, or just pop your hand up um, on the 
as like the zoom function or do both. Um, and I'm going to take a screenshot so we can share it with the Enviro Collective and the um, Refugee Action Collective. So if you don't want to be in the photo, just turn your camera off. But yeah. Um, <laughs> there we go thank you everyone um and thank you for coming were there any last thoughts from anyone before we go we're a bit over time already um i've oh yeah so uh sorry one last thing uh we were gonna play thanks leah um we're gonna play just a two minute video uh from enviro collective it's been made by enviro collective members um, just about the, the curry curry gas plant and the, the week of action. Um, do you want to reshare your screen, Leah? Yeah, there we go. Sorry, I just had to make sure I was sharing sound. Okay, it should work. Cool. The climate crisis is wreaking havoc around the world. Unprecedented heat waves, floods, and fires have thrashed Europe, North America, China, and Siberia. Drought has created catastrophic famine in Madagascar, leading to massive amounts of death and destruction. This is only the beginning for our rapidly warming world. The most recent IPCC report has been labelled a code red for humanity and paints a picture of rapidly escalating irreversible destruction to the planet on which we rely. Yet the Liberal government is pushing ahead with its gas fire recovery, which it claims will help rebuild the economy by supporting fossil fuels. Central to this plan is the Curry Curry gas plant in New South Wales, which will be government owned and is set to be built with $600 million of taxpayer money. Claims that the Curry Curry gas plant will help the economy are baseless. Morrison claims that this plant will create hundreds of jobs for working class people. But after construction, the plant will only create 10 full-time jobs. Not only is it economically baseless, the Curry Curry plant will release 14.8 million tonnes of greenhouse gas emissions on top of desecrating Gomorrah lands in the Pilica region. With no extensive job creation, no economic benefit and disastrous greenhouse gas emissions, why is the government set on Curry Curry? Last financial year, the Morrison government gave $12 billion in tax breaks to the fossil fuel industry, while also receiving hundreds of thousands of dollars in donations from fossil fuel giants. Curry Curry and the gas fire recovery as a whole isn't a strategy for economic rebuilding from the COVID recession, but a multi-million dollar handout to the Liberals' fossil fuel mates. Morrison wants to look strong on jobs by justifying his climate inaction by dividing environmentalists and workers. But climate activists are not taking the bait. The people in Curry Curry need and deserve good jobs, but this gas plant and fossil fuels in general won't deliver them. Instead of building a publicly owned gas plant and funding more fossil fuels, we demand a just transition. We're calling on the government to create thousands of good union jobs, publicly owned renewables. The week starting Monday, August 23rd will be a week of action supported by School Strike for Climate, Workers for Climate Action and the Gas Free Hunter Alliance against Kari Kari and for climate jobs. Trade unionists, First Nations people and activists will come together to pressure the government to stop Curry Curry and fund the public renewables and climate jobs we need. The actions you can take are small but can have a big impact. You can take a photo with your family, friends or workmates with a sign saying stop Curry Curry, post it to social media with a caption of why you oppose the gas fired recovery. You could also organise an in-person, COVID safe action. During the week of action, you should join the online rally at 6 p.m. on 25th of August over Zoom. More information about the week of action and how you can get involved can be found on the Workers for Climate Action and UCID Enviro Collective Facebook pages. Every day, we are creeping closer towards climate catastrophe, but we are not powerless. Join the week of action to send a strong message that we will not let the planet die without a fight. Climate change is now rapid, widespread, and intensifying. That is according to a devastating report by the UN's Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which warns that many human-caused effects are now irreversible. The UN Secretary General called the findings a code red for humanity, adding that it must be a death knell for coal and fossil fuels. Cool, that was that. Drew was so dramatic, it was amazing. Um, <laughs> Yes, uh, and everyone else is wonderful too. Well, thank you for coming. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank Thanks, you. everyone, for organizing. Thanks.